Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to TechGeek webinar series, our endeavor to impart techies. We believe that sharing of knowledge is the key to enhance our skills and grow us as professionals. With this principle in mind, we have initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give you all a crisp insight of various domains. The topic of today's session is discussing five C's of leadership skills. And this is the second session in the series by Mr. Surya Prakash. And the name of the series is Learning Leadership Principles from the Bhagavad Gita. Unlock your potential to become the person that others want to follow. Our guest speaker, Mr. Surya Prakash, is working and living in Australia. He is working for SMS Management and Technology as a management consultant and trainer. He has more than 12 years of experience in management and technology roles in Australia. He has a strong background in project management, business management, and in the development of higher order socio-cognitive skills. Prior to joining SMS, he has worked as a project manager, a lecturer, and a lawyer. He is also the member of Australian Institute of Project Management. So without further delay, I introduce you all to our guest speaker. Over to you, Surya. Thank you, Mani. Hello, everyone. Just a quick uh, recap from the last session. In the last session, we had discussed about 10 C's of leadership skills, four principles of leadership skills, and mind management. In four principles, we had discussed about Stiti Pragya, Niskam Karmyog, Samuta, Avadhana. And we had also discussed about four principles, practicing four principles. And with self-restraint, we'll be able to develop these 10 leadership skills. In the last session, we had emphasized on the importance of mind management and four principles. We had briefly touched on 10 C's of leadership skills. These 10 leadership skills, they are coming from Bhagavad Gita, Krishna's life, and they have got references in the chapters of Bhagavad Gita. In this session, we'll discuss five C's, and they are common sense, communication, commitment, competence, and confidence. In the next session, we'll discuss conviction, character, courage, clarity, coach. This, the next session is supposed to be held on 14th of June at 5. We won't be able to cover all the 10 C's in this session, so I've just divided into two sessions. Now, before we start this session, I would like to answer one question that was raised in the previous session which I was not able to get to and later I realized it when I had actually logged out. There was a question that why are we mixing spirituality with uh, management and leadership? In reality it is not mixing. They have always been there but now in the modern times we are trying to identify those things and drive inspirations from there. I'll tell you a story. There was a person working in a very big organization and he was a very high profile manager. He used to bring his work at home or very often he used to bring his work at, at home. One day his four year old son wanted to play with him. And he was busy doing work things and he was least interested in playing with his son. He saw a piece of paper lying on his desk and it was a world map. So he tore it into pieces and he gave it to his son saying that it will keep him busy for at least one or two hours. And he said that look, when you 
get the world together, I'll start playing with you. So he said, take this, come back to me when you have got the world mapped together. So the son went and he came back in 10 minutes. Father was amazed. He thought, how could he do that in 10 minutes? So he asked a question to his son. My dear son, how you are able to do it in just 10 minutes? For me, it would have taken at least one or two hours to do it but you have just done it in 10 minutes. He said, Father, it is simple. At the back of the world map, there was a picture of man. I had put the man together and the world came together. That is what we are doing. If we put the picture of the man together, the world will fall into place and that is what it is. With all the technologies, with all the scientific developments, and with all the management theory, we have not been able to put the man together and that's the reason man is searching everywhere else in the world and he's still unhappy. Martin Luther Jr. he said that our scientific power has overpowered our spiritual power. We have got guided missiles and misguided men. And the idea here is to have a complete man to have a very inclusive and humanistic approach to every piece of work that we do. And that is what it is. It is not mix, mixing spirituality with management. If spirituality has been there. All these books, they have been there. Before we started with any management theory, before we started with any leadership skills, before we started with anything, these things were there. Look, in the first session, I did mention that leader, Bhagavad Gita is first ever book on leadership, first ever book on management. Modern Western philosophers, modern Western thinkers, they have actually derived those values from those books. And these books, they have not been given due credit. Uh, on, I'll just mention, I'll briefly touch on this. I just remember one thing. Pythagoras theorem, it, was, it actually came from India, but the credit was never given to Indians. And there was a philosopher, his name was Voltaire, he was a French philosopher, if I can remember correctly, and he said that everything has come to us through the banks of Ganges, and that's very true, and that's what it is. All the modern philosophies, that's what my belief is, that all the modern philosophies, all the modern psychology, all the modern management theories, all the management leadership skills, they actually have come from Bhagavad Gita. And that's where it is and that's what we are trying to do and that's what these sessions are about. Lifelong we have been doing the same mistake. Our face is covered in dust but we have been trying to clean the mirror and that is the mistake. It is the fault lies within us. It's not the mirror that is giving us a different picture. We are covered with self-doubt. We are covered by lack of confidence. We are covered by low self-esteem and that is what Bhagavad Gita is helping us to. Bhagavad Gita is actually helping us to rediscover ourselves, which we have not been able to do that. If we are able to put the man together, the world will come together. And that's the basic crucial idea. So we will start this session. Now, there is the first C is common sense. Common sense, I have read many management and leadership books, but I have not been able to, all these C's I have off and on, they have not got... Uh, they have been referred in some of the other books, but I haven't seen any book in which they have actually discussed about common sense and this common sense idea is coming from Bhagavad Gita. I haven't, I don't remember, I haven't seen anything, I haven't read anywhere in any particular book which says that common sense, common sense is very essential skill for leadership. And I have actually taken it from Bhagavad Gita because chapter 2 talks about common sense. Now in Sanskrit, common sense means Sahaj Buddhi. And in Hindi, common sense means vehvare buddhi. Now, and that is what it is, and I'll trace it to the English meaning of it. And in English, it can be literally translated into vehvare buddhi. Cambridge Dictionary, it describes that the basic level of practical knowledge and judgment that we all need to help us live in a reasonable and safe manner. That's what it says. It says a practical knowledge and judgment and word practical here is very important. What practical means? The practical, it says, Oxford Dictionary explains what practical means. Practical is acquired through practice 
or action not through theory that's what the emphasis is common sense is a knowledge and judgment that we need need in our daily day to day living so that we are safe and we are able to survive and that practical knowledge is not gained by theory it is not gained by any intellectuals it is not gained by big gurus those who talk about management theories and leadership skills but it comes from common man it comes from daily experience it comes from what you have uh, acquired what you experience in your life and that is what common sense is once you burn your finger in the fire you won't put your finger again in the fire that is common sense and if you do that again that means that you are a retarded person that you lack the basic ability you cannot make your faculties cannot discriminate what is good for you and what is bad for you so that's what common sense is and in chapter 2 krishna takes a very common sense approach he now he has used two theories in that which is which is not been identified but in modern ways it is identified as risk perception theory and it is identified as maximum risk theory which is very common in economics we have got this maximum risk theory whereas in chapter 2 he that's what the whole emphasis is arjun the way he is emphasizing the way he is actually seeing the situation the way he is perceiving the situation is different to what krishna thinks and feels here the risk that is being analyzed by arjun is out of proportion and the risk that krishna sees is different and that's where krishna is trying to emphasize that risk that you see is not what you see you are not actually afraid of killing people but you are actually afraid of being killed in this battlefield and then he comes to this theory that maximum risk theory that what have you got to lose in this he says if you win this battle you get a kingdom if you lose this battle and you die then you will be remembered in the history as the greatest hero ever lived but if you run away from this battlefield you will be doomed in the history of humanity that you your reputation is going to go downhill that you are not at all a hero you left the battlefield and that's where he uses that maximum risk theory and he's he's using that approach to motivate arjun so he says the risk that you see is not right and what you think you are going to lose is again not right what have you got to lose and then he says if you die die you, you will die death is unavoidable you you do you die you don't do you still die death is unavoidable why not make the best of what you have now if you are standing in the battlefield why not make the best of what you have rather than thinking of ifs and buts and thinking what will happen and which and what will not happen and that's where chapter 2 verse 47 comes in he says that you don't have to worry about the fruits of your action what you have to do is that you have to concentrate on the doing of the action and that's where this this particular verse has been misinterpreted that you don't need to worry about the fruits now you don't you don't need to worry about the fruits if you are trying to perform your action what is your first priority is your first priority is to perform your action and when you perform your action the fruit is not under your control so it, how does it matter means how what can you do means if you have done a job fruits are not within your control so he says your emphasis your whole emphasis should be on doing your duty rather than actually finding out what will happen and what will not happen he says that if i participate in this war i'll kill my relatives and what is the use of this battle he says that don't go into that negativity you don't you, there is there is no scope of negativity there is no scope of being escapist what you have to do is that you have to concentrate on what the duty you have been given what the duty you have taken what the sa dharma you have accepted sa dharma means the dharma that you have accepted by your own self no one has imposed anything on you so he says that you have to concentrate on what you have got to do and that's where he takes that risk perception theory in in uh, psychology this is called as cognitive theory and in sociology it is called as cultural theory and here that is what what it basically what means is that everyone perceives risk in a different manner that's what he, that's where it the risk perception theory comes in and throughout the chapter 2 off and on that's what krishna has been emphasizing in and he has been using a very common sense approach and he used a very common sense approach in risk a maximum risk theory in explaining that you don't have anything to lose
means now you don't have any alternative. The only alternative that you have is to fight. Because if you can, if you run away from this battlefield, that is not going to help you because you are a chhatriya. You have got a dharma. You have got a duty to perform. And you, if you perform your duty, if you die, you will be remembered as a hero. If you if you don't die and if you win it, then you you'll get a kingdom, and that is what you have been waiting for ten years. Now, here common sense approach. I'll I'll tell you what. Uh, I'm trying to make a, a distinction between Krishna and Arjuna. Arjuna Arjun is a, a leader in making, whereas Krishna is a is the leader. Now, this is the picture that we see in front of the screen is that Karn Karn is stuck with that wheel. His wheel is stuck in the mud, and he's trying to pull his wheel out of that. Uh, mud, and then he's taken time out, and Arjun is waiting. So he's waiting for he's waiting patiently for Karan to take out his wheel. Now, Krishna says that, "What are you waiting for? You you need to you need to kill Karan right now. There is no point in actually waiting for it." But he 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 gave, goes into that morality of it. He goes into the um, ethics and legality of it. He says that, "Look, I cannot uh, kill someone who is not prepared to fight. He's actually doing something." else and he has got he's not having his bow and arrow with him so this is not the right dharma so he said look now you have to perform your duty now you're getting into that legality and morality here the common sense comes into play and krishna says that this is day 17 of the mahabharat war he says on day 13 your son abhimanyu he was literally murdered and they had violated all the rules and regulations of war. Now if you go into this legality and morality of this, that this is not right and that is not right, then you won't be able to kill Karn. And Krishna knew that in the back of his mind that Karn is a superior warrior than Arjuna. And because from, from day 13 to day 17, Arjuna has been trying very hard to kill Karn. And Karn had proved to be a very powerful warrior, and Arjuna was not able to kill Karn. And that was, and that's where Krishna takes a common sense approach. He says that if you need to make the best use of the opportunity that you have, time and tide waits for none. So if if you go into that legality, it is the question of life and death. You may lose your own life. Now, the next one is Draupadi in the court. Again, it is full of people. Now a woman is lost in a gambling. Woman is treated as a property. See where the common sense approach is. And they are all, they are five husbands. They have lost him, lost her in the gamble. Now the court is full of men people. It is full of all learned people like Vidur, like Bhish, like Drona, like Kripachar, like Dhritarast. They all are in the court, but still a woman is called in the court. And she is being outraged of her modesty. They are trying to strip her. Now here Krishna again takes a common sense approach. Could you imagine that? That a person, a woman, a lady being in the court full of men, people trying to get rid of her clothes. There could be some ulterior motives. That's fine. But see where the common sense approach is. Losing her in a gamble and then getting her in, in the court and getting rid of her clothes. See, the, Krishna uses a very common sense approach. No, you can't do that. Th again, there's another common sense approach displayed by Mahatma Gandhi. In, in During British rule, India had to pay tax on salt. So there was a salt tax that was imposed on all Indians. Mahatma Gandhi took this as a non-cooperation movement and he said that there would be civil disobedience and on March 12, 1930 he did a march which was called as Dandi March or Salt uh, Satyagra. Just to break that law, common sense approach, you have got the ocean, you have got the sea, you have got the man, you have got the land to make the salt, then why, why, don't, why not oppose the law? And he, he, he took that march with everyone and he broke the law. And that is the common sense approach. Means legality won't help you. The law of court won't help you. Somewhere, some places, you have to take that common sense approach. And this is another example of common sense approach. And there's another one uh, that I've got a small picture of that. It, you are fired. These days, in corporate world, we don't use our common sense approach. Suppose if a high-performing employee 
is underperforming and what we do is that we get rid of that employee without actually taking a common sense approach of finding out what exactly the problem is, why from being a productive employee he has become an unproductive employee, what is the problem? It could be a personal problem, it could be a family problem, it could be something, it could be a health related problem. So in that situation being a leader, being a manager we need to take a very common sense approach and I'm not kidding, I'm, not, I'm serious. There was an article written by Laurie, Laurie Bodman, he said that in start of this millennia common sense has died and we don't and in particularly in corporate world it is in coma we don't make use of common sense approach we don't take use and we may we are not very we are very very reluctant in using a common sense approach and he wrote a very funny article which was very appreciated by people and he said that uh, uh, common sense died at the start of this millennia and we are going to attend a funeral of common sense common sense is survived by one wife discretion one daughter responsibility, son, reason, and two stepbrothers, half wit and dim wit. So that's what the, it is in the corporate world. We, we are very reluctant to use the common sense approach. We'll move we'll quick, quickly move to the next slide. Now the next slide is about communication, which is again very important. Communication in Sanskrit, it means samva, which literally means two-way communication. Communicating two ways that there is a person who is sending a message, there is a person who is receiving the message and, the, and this, the model that you see over there that was proposed by Aristotle and this is still remains true no matter where we are, whether we have one-to-one -one communication or whether we have a personal communication or we are trying to communicate in a corporate setup. So there is a sender who sends the message, there is a listener who receives the message. Now in communication, in leadership, in management, attentive listening is very important. And attentive listening, in attentive listening there are five things that we pay attention to what is being said, we stay in the present, we build self-esteem of the person who's communicating with us, that's what Krishna did throughout that discourse and you'll see that all different names have been used for Arjuna, sometimes he's referred as Maha Bahu, sometimes he's referred as Mahabali, sometimes he's referred as Parth, sometimes he's referred as Dhanurda. So he's trying to build his self-esteem. The whole of Gita is about trying to motivate someone who is actually uh, as, uh, psychologically depressed. He's acting as a psycholo uh, the psychologist who is trying to counsel a psychiatric patient. Now it is trying to reflect on the person who is trying to say something and at the same time to acknowledge the message that is being sent uh, the, from the sender. So that's these are the five things that are important and listening why active listening is important? Active listening has got very important play to uh, play. We have got two ears and one mouth. So in that percentage, it is 66% listening is important. Again, there was a survey that are done by market experts and they said that listening is 75% important in communication. There was another survey that was done by an organization in America, which was a creative uh, center for learning and they said that active listening is 80 percent important. Nelson Mandela, he has got a very good listening ability. He had acquired this listening ability from his father who was the chief of a tribe. He, his father was, a, um, he, he adopted, Nelson Mandela was adopted. His father's name was Chief Jogin Taba. He was chief of a tribe. So Nelson Mandela had this habit of actually gathering all the leaders and listening to them first before answering and jumping into any of the solutions. He used to listen to each and every leader patiently and then he used to arrive to conclusion. We, what we do is that without listening, we arrive to conclusion and we make a judgment and opinion of the person who is giving that uh, information to us. Now, leadership communication tips. This is coming from chapter 16. This is coming from chapter the 17 verse 15 and it is coming from chapter 13. It says that give people ownership and importance that when you try to communicate with someone, try to uplift that person, try to make that person feel important and give that person importance and ownership of what, uh, what the message he's trying to convey. Second communication tip is do what you say and say what you do. It means that your action should confirm to what you say, 
it, it should not be other way around that you say something and you do something. It says that what you say you should do and what you do that is what you should say. Think. Then your third point is think before you speak. Every word that you think, you should think it very carefully. It is that you need to choose your words carefully. It is not say what you choose. It is rather choose what you say. You get the point? Means you, you cannot just say anything. Say what you choose means it's your mouth and you say everything. That's not a good tip. It is you choose what you have to say. And that is what it is before you communicate, before you send that message, be careful. Think before you speak. And then fourth is talk less, say more. You don't have to talk a lot to convey a very important message. You can talk less, but still you can convey the message and you can still convey the idea in a very uh, concise manner, in a very expressive manner, which, is, which has got some worth, which has got some importance, which has got some gravity. Now, there is a last one is be courteous. And there are three actual words. They are coming from chapter 16, and they are from uh, sloka 1 to 3. It means arjana. It means being straightforward. Apayasunnam means devoid of any cunningness. And mardavam means soft spoken. It says that you have to be straightforward. Don't be cunning. And at the same time, be soft-spoken. These are the leadership communication tips. And I've got a, a small picture of uh, uh, Winston Churchill. He was a very good communicator. And uh, at that time, Adolf Hitler was also a good communicator. And he was able to get whole of Germany together and to wage a racial war and whole of Germany and whole of the army, German army and allied, they united to get rid of uh, Jews and um, uh, Adolf Hitler, he had this theory that uh, only Aryans have got the right to live in this world and that's the reason he had this swastik and he said that all those who are non-Aryans, they need to die and that's where he killed millions and millions of people were there. And Winston Churchill uh, was uh, a Prime Minister of UK and he was a Prime Minister from 1940 to 1945 and from 1951 to 1955. Uh, 1951 to 1955. And sometimes I wonder that you need adverse situation to exhale. So excellent science in adversity, I, I don't think without Adolf Hitler, uh, Winston Churchill would be so famous and renowned and uh, some a great considered as a great leader in the history of humanity, but he was there. So when he was when he became prime minister of UK, and he was asked, see the dedication and commitment of that politician, and you can compare with the politicians that we have nowadays. He was he was giving his first speech, and he was trying to say that I'm ready, and I, we need to fight the war with uh, Germans. And he was giving his first speech in the parliament and the House of Commons. They asked the question that what have you got to offer? Now you, Mr. Prime Minister, what have you got to offer? And he said, I have got to offer my blood. I have got to offer my sweat. I have got to offer my work. I have got, my, I have got to offer my labor. That is what I have got to offer. Then he said, what is your policy? And he said, policy is to wage war by land, wage war by sea, wage war by air. That is my policy. And then the, the last question was, that was his speech, which is very famous speech. And the last question was, what is your aim? And that's where the sign comes from, victory. He said, my only aim is to win. Win, 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 victory at any cost. Victory at any life cost. Victory at any at any point. So that's what the, his aim is. So that he, that's what the communication over here means. That is the mark of a leader, to be a good communicator. We we'll move to the next slide. Next slide is about uh, commitment. Commitment in Sanskrit, it means Pratibandhata, and Pratibandhata comes from Pratigya, and I have got one slide where Bhishma is uh, taking that oath. Now, this is coming from chapter 16, verse 2. Achaplam, achapalam. It says is steadfastness, freedom from fickleness, thinking something now, thinking another thing after some time, 
And a third thing, tomorrow, and never, never having any concept of final aim of life, and that is what commitment is, and this is what it has been defined in chapter two. This is this is the particular word that has been used, and this particular word has been explained by Krishnananda, and that's the explanation that he has given. He says that it is steadfastness, freedom from fickleness. It's not that I'll do this and I'll do that. Thinking something now, thinking another thing after some time, and third thing tomorrow, and never having any concept of the final aim of life. That's what it is. Its commitment is firm. This is commitment is something that drives you forward. Commitment is something that drives your vision forward. That is what commitment is. When everything in the world fails and it is commitment which whispers once more. It says that let's try once more. Let's try once more. That is what commitment is. So it says here, I've got this here. Promise is an expression of interest and commitment is a promise to keep the promise no matter what. And this is what the slide comes here, Bhishma. Bhishma taking that Bhishma, Pratigya, that I won't marry. He is taking that oath, he's taking that Pratigya and that Pratigya becomes a Pratibandha. And he takes that oath that I will not marry in my life. Because his father wanted to marry a lady, her name was Satyavati. And the, the and father of Satyavati had this that the your son who is right now the son he should not become the king the son born from Satyavati should be the ruler and that's where the dilemma was so he asked uh, Vishma asked his father that father why are you upset father narrated that story to him and he said it's simple so he went there and he took that pratigya that I will never marry and I'll be bachelor throughout my life and that is where it became a pratigya from pratigya and became a pratibandata and lifelong he became he remained a, a bachelor and there was a situation that uh, nature wanted to test him as well when he had abducted three ladies from uh, Kashi Amba, Ambika and Balika and Amba wanted to, Amba was in love with some other princess and then later because she was abducted he refused to marry her so Amba went to, went back to uh, Krishna, uh, sorry, went back to Bhishma saying that now I have got nowhere to go, what should I do now I was in love and that prince is not accepting me and now the only thing that you have got is you need to break your promise and you need to break your commitment you need to marry me, he said that that is not, that is not going to happen. So she said that, look, I'll become the cause of your death. And that's where she Shikhandi comes into. And now this battle on the 10th day of this Mahabharat battle, Bhishma was actually, uh, in my opinion, and in opinion of Dinka Ji as well, uh, where Dinka Ji has written a uh, Rashmi Rati. And in that, he's explained, it's a very good poem. If you get time, just read it. And according to that, when I read it, I get this idea that Bhishma and Karn, they were actually a superior warrior than uh, Arjuna. And even Krishna has mentioned at one place that uh, he's explaining to Arjuna and he says that Krishna, he's, uh, Karn is Arjun either equal to you or superior in power. Karn is either equal in strength or superior in strength. So even uh, Krishna had that in his back of his mind that Karan is actually a superior warrior and that's where that apprehension is coming when he's stuck with that wheel. He thinks that it is the best, this is the best time and we should make the best use of the opportunity that the nature has given us rather than actually getting into the legality and that's where he says that kill him. If you don't kill him, he's going to kill you. And that's where second, now on the uh, tenth day of the Mahabharat, Bhishma was creating a havoc and he was cre killing thousands and thousands of Pandavas army. So what he, uh, thousands and thousands of uh, um, Pandava soldiers. So Arjun and all the five Pandava brothers, they went to Bhishma and said that, look, can you tell us how to kill you? Because if you continue in all this 10 days, look, all that 10 days Bhishma was able to uh, continue the war, but when Bhishma, Bhishma was killed, the battle ended just after eight days and Bhishma was the leader of uh, Korva's army. So they went there and asking him that, can you tell me wo, how, how we can get rid of you, how we can kill you? So he said it's very simple because I, my commitment is that I have taken an oath that I will never fight a woman and I'll never fa fight a transgender. And they said that if you bring a woman or if you bring a transgender in front of me, I won't raise my bow and arrow. So that's very simple. The moment I don't fight, you can uh, pin uh, thousands and thousands of arrows in my body and I'm dead. So that's where Sikhandi uh, comes into Sikhandi. There, there is a story which says that Amma, which was abducted from uh, uh, Kasi, Kasi is now Sikhandi and she in the next life 
uh, she becomes Sikandi, a transgender, and now she becomes the cause of Bhishma's death. So she is brought in front uh, of um, Bhishma, and Arjuna, the great warrior, is hiding behind Shikhandi. And when uh, Shikhandi is standing in front of Bhishma, Bhishma says, "Look, I'm ready to give my life. I'm ready to die, but I'm not ready to break my commitment. I have a promise, is promise, and if I have made a promise, promise, I'll keep my promise no matter what." And that's where he chose to die, and he was uh, thousands of arrows were pinned into his body, and that's how he died. And I'll just give you another story. There's the Ritik Roshan. I'll just quickly. I've got. I've been Ritik Roshan. Um, there's a he's also a man who's got an in, intense amount of commitment. At the age of six, he started stammering and, um, and he became self-conscious and he had uh, low confidence, he lacked confidence and because of be becoming self-aware, uh, because he, had, he has six fingers and at that time he was obese as well. So when in school, people, uh, children, they started teasing him and he became uh, over-conscious and self-conscious and he started losing his uh, self-confidence in himself and he started stammering and that continued and still now he, he stammers but at the age of 17 or 18 he had that desire that I want to become an actor see that an actor who cannot deliver a dialogue who cannot talk properly had this idea vision of that I want to become an actor. I see the amount of commitment that this person has. That every film he does, that he prepares for hours and hours behind the scene in front of the mirror to deliver his dialogue. It's online. It is online. It's it's there that it talks about Hrithik Roshan's uh, speech problems and speech therapy. That see that that is the commitment. So every film he does, every single dialogue that he delivers, he has to rehearse it in front of the camera and he has to make that fluency. It is not that natural. It is not coming naturally, it is coming, he has to actually practice it. For many of us, we are gifted that we can speak smoothly. So see that the communication is playing a very important role and that is what I mean by commitment. Next, we'll move to competence. Competence in uh, Sanskrit, it means uh, yogita. And what is competence? I'll explain it in a very simple manner. If you don't know what fire is, it is ignorance. If you know what fire is, is and what are the properties of fire it is competence now if you know what to do with the fire when to do and what not to do with the fire that becomes virtue and now how to light the fire what to get and ignite the fire, that is competence. And combination of knowledge, virtue, competence is wisdom. I'll repeat, if you, if you don't know what it is, it is ignorance. But if you only know what it is, like it is fire, and if you know the properties of fire, that becomes knowledge. But if you have the competence, if you have the ability to light the fire, if you have the ability to ignite the fire, if you, if you know that this is the process of igniting the fire, that is competence. And what is the virtue? Virtue is what to do with the fire, what not to do with the fire, and when to do what is the virtue. And combination of these three things makes it wisdom. And that's exactly what it says in chapter 2, verse 50. Yoga, Kamsu, Kosu. Competence and performance of action. And this is a very famous, uh, which is being used in IIT. I lost word. What to mention? What they, um, how they use it? They they use the IIT Institute. They use it, and this they explain it as excellence in action. Whereas Adi Sangrachar in his Gita Bhashya, he explains it competence. You what is yoga? Yoga is competence in performance of action. Competence means the ability, the idea, how to do something in utmost perfection. That is what it means. Yoga. Yoga. A combination of this one is competence plus performance of action makes yoga. Forget about yoga. Concentrate on competence. Competence is what to do and how to do. That is competence. When competence and your action is perform, performed together, that makes it yoga. Performance of action is mean 
putting your hundred percent, putting your whole heart and soul into it, and then you're performing it to the perfection. That is what it is. In the last session, I did mention about um, uh, um, Martin Luther's idea about the sweeper. That is what it means. It means that any act, any work, anything that you do, you put your soul into that. You put your heart into that. That is what it is. It is competence. And now here the question is: confidence without competence is delusional, and competence without confidence is unfulfilled potential exactly competence and confidence they go hand in hand if you may have all the confidence in the world but if you lack that competence if you hide the fire you won't be able to do it you you think that you have all got the confidence but it is delusional you can't do anything but competence you have the idea that this is how we can do it but you lack the confidence you think that if i light the fire if i ignite the fire i may get burned so that is you lacking the confidence so you will never be able to ignite the fire that's what it says that unfulfilled potential so that's where it is Arjuna is a very competent archer he was able to stuck that arrow in the eye of the spinning fish but he lacks confidence here and that's where it is it is unfulfilled potential and that's where Krishna Krishna comes into play you have the confidence you are sorry you have the competence but lack confidence you get someone to actually boost your confidence and now you have got a perfect combination of your confidence and competence and then you you are able to achieve the targeted goal that's where it is so both both confidence and competence they need to go hand in hand so either of them without he, um, kind of, uh, the confidence or competence is um, meaningless. So that's where it is. Suppose a, a person who has got all the confidence of the world, but and he thinks that he can fly the plane. He cannot fly the plane because he lacks the competence. And a person who, who is a competent pilot, but he lacks the confidence to fly the plane, he won't be able to fly the plane. See that that's where it is. That's the way where, 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 where the two have got the important role to play. Now we'll uh, move to uh, confidence, which will take a bit of a time. Now confidence is the belief that you have in yourself, the faith that you have in your abilities. That is what confidence is, and confidence can be situational as well state of being certain that or that a chosen course of action is the best or most effective that is a state of being certain that you are certain that yes you can do it you have you believe in yourself you believe in your abilities that I can do it you have full faith that you can perform this particular task or action or work that is confidence Next, which is coming from dictionary, Webster dictionary, it says state of feeling certain about the truth of something that is confidence, and that here the confidence what we are talking about is the confidence about your own abilities. If you lack confidence about yourself, no one is going to help you. You will have a mentor, you can get a coach, you can get someone to boost your confidence off and on, but then ultimately you are responsible for your own confidence. You have to be responsible you have to consider your own merits and demerits if you keep that negative self-talk that I, oh, I lack this I can't do it if you think that you can't do it you can't do it and that's where this confidence comes into play now there are two important tips of uh, confidence building tips this is coming from chapter 6 verse 5 Stop negative self-talk. This becomes very vicious because self-confidence is your mind game. If you keep feeding this negative thought to your mind that, oh, I'm useless, I'm worthless, I can't do it, mind will say, yes, you are worthless, you're useless, you can't do it. So what, will, what it, it is going to do is that it is going to reinforce your own belief about your own self. Now, if you stop that, that's the thing that you need to stop that on day one. Everyone in life has got ups and downs. It is not that there is no one on this earth who has not faced any difficulty or any problem, but that is what differentiates a leader. That's what differentiates a manager. That's what it differentiates a successful employee from others, that you stop that negative. Everyone fails, and failure is a pillar of success. It doesn't mean that if you have failed in life, you're useless, you're worthless. 
and that's where it says that you need you should not debase yourself you should not degrade yourself and that that's where this chapter says that you should not lower yourself by your own self if you feel that you're inferior you are inferior abraham now roosevelt said that no one which i said that in the last session that no one can make you feel inferior without your consent so if you have given consent to your mind that i am inferior i lack this confidence i lack this ability mind is going to say that yes fine you lack this ability you're useless you're worthless you can't do this duty go home and relax so now the second thing again i only i won't put that i don't, i only consider that these two points are very important in boosting your self confidence in elevating your self confidence in improving your self confidence and the second point is be fearless by establishing yourself in yourself and having confidence in yourself that is a be fearless there is no other person in this planet except than you if you think if you if you're dependent on someone that this person is going to help you out yes it may be a temporary thing but not a permanent solution permanent solution is that you have to be fearless and you have to seek help within yourself yourself is the very potent energy bundle that resides within your soul that resides within your heart and you have to drive all that inspiration all that strength all that um, character from is within you so that would say fearless be fearless you don't need to fear in the last session we mentioned that what is fear fear is false evidence appearing real that's fine but why do we fear take let's take a briefly let's take a psychological perspective and I'll finish in two minutes we'll take a psychological perspective and this fear is only there when you think that you're going to lose something either it is loss of life either it is loss of uh, wealth or just loss of health or loss of love or something that is the fear once you get rid of that fear you are fearless and that's the message of uh, krishna to arjuna that you don't have to fear that's where the chapter 2 comes into what have you got to fear you don't have anything to fear if you die you will be remembered as a great hero if you win you get the kingdom and if you run away from this you're going to live whole of your life as a coward that's the message that's what it says that you need to be fearless you need to and the only way that you can be fearless is that you believe in yourself you have your own abilities and it did i briefly touch and this is the screenplay that i see uh, that the picture that we have on the screen is about arjuna krishna and duryodhan where they go they approach krishna saying that look we need your help and see the confidence of krishna what he says is that i have got only two things i have got uh, one is me another that army that you have got and i have got my army which is narayani sena so what how can i help you i have got only two things that i have got one is my army one is me my, myself so arjuna says that look uh, and i can only uh, either of you can choose one of uh, one of us so arjuna says that look i need you so that's where the see the confidence of the man the krishna he says that i am as good as one army and he didn't say that look i have got this narayani sena that's what he called his army as narayani sena so he said that look i have got narayani sena i'll divide this into half the duryodhan you take the half army and you take the half army and that is you be happy but he says now nah, i have got the whole army which has got lakhs and lakhs of uh, soldiers in that and then i am myself so now the choice is yours what do you want uh, arjuna being uh, he he decided to go with a competent uh, uh, leader whereas duryodhan he decided to go with the army he thought that the strength has got a very important role to play so he went with the larger number whereas arjuna took a very wise decision and this is where wisdom comes into play he opted for a competent leader he opted for a competent leader and a competent leader is worth one army and i can give you an example like mahatma gandhi he was as good as army uh, george washington in uh, united states he was a one man army nelson mandela he was one man army you didn't need the whole army you didn't need 10 million indian soldiers to win from british is the uh, mahatma gandhi and he took that non violence approach one man army george washington non one man army N nelson mandela very competent and that's where it is confident competent leader is worth anything in the world now a uh, briefly one minute i'll take on opera as well opera winfrey at the age as she was born to an uh, unmarried teenager mother at the age of 9 she was sexually abused by her uncle family friends cousin at the age of 14 she's a famous tv personality and i'll get to that at the age of 14 she became pregnant 
at the age of 20, she started taking drugs. At the age of 32, she became the richest woman on the planet. See, from zero, she became hero. She see the light, that is the confidence, and from the, and the journey from age 20 to journey 32, it wasn't easy. Everyone in the world said that you can't do it, you can't make it, you can't make it as an anchor on the TV shows. But she had that confidence in her. And that is from, from in 12 years, she became the richest woman on the planet. This is what I mean by confidence. Now we'll quickly move and I'll summarize the slide here. In the, I'll, I'll summarize it. This is, this, this is coming from chapter 3 and chapter 5 and I've quoted the slokas as well. It says, by restraining the sense organs and settling the energy of the senses in the mind, settling the mind in the intellect and settling, and settling the intellect in the buddhi or the self inside, one restrains the total personality of oneself and attains the goal of self-discipline. And this is where this idea is and I'm trying to draw a continuity between the last session and this, is, uh, this session. The, if, we, if we can recall that the model that we have, this model was, that model is based upon this, that you actually drive that energy from within and that's where you develop your own skills and this is what five skills we have for ten skills that we have we have discussed five skills in this all those ten skills they reside within us how we can do it by mind management by using our intellect by using our faculty to discriminate and uplift ourselves and boost our personality that's where it is coming and that's where it is it is not I'm not talking about that's to prove that I'm not talking about Aji Baji or I'm doing Gab Baji it is about what is coming from the chapter so this is to win your trust and confidence and we have forgot that in confidence it is all the matter of um, winning the trust of other person. I'll um, finish it here and uh, we'll, I will uh, see if I'll, there are some questions. We'll quickly answer those questions. Thank you all for attending it. I'll okay, so um, the first question that I get is when is this going to start? So we have already started and we are going to finish it. That's from Raju. So, so that has been answered. Okay, sometimes when you give importance to someone, he overestimates him herself and starts thinking he is more important and better than you. How to deal with this? Uh, Samaima Muhammad. <coughs> Look, that to answer this, I'll give you one. Civility is not the sign of weakness. It is, it is the problem of the person who thinks that he or she is superior, that is their problem. You don't need to worry about it. Let, uh, let that person think what they have to think. You be, the, the way to deal with this situation is, the way to approach this situation is that you be true self. You be real. Don't have to imitate anyone. You don't have to prove any point. You just be what you think is right. If that person thinks or feels elevated by your civility, by your politeness, by your humility, it is his problem. But yes, you need to draw a line. Do not allow that person to take advantage of yourself. The moment the person is trying to cross the line, you have to be assertive, not aggressive. That's what it is. So that's where my idea is. That's what my belief and experience is. Now the next question is, please comment. Aim of the life is fraction to hold transformation. It can be applied to management principle as well. Well, you have said it. Yes, uh, Kumran Madurai. So you have already explained it. Aim of life is fraction to hold of transformation. That's why that's the aim of whole life. Whatever there is nothing to come in. It can be applied to management principle. Yes, it, it can be um, applied to the principle of management as well. Yes, we, we all are. This is called a system thinking. The, this the approach that you're suggesting is it is called a system thinking. We are we think that we are separate. We but we are not separate. We are part of that bigger system, and everyone has got a role to play in this bigger system, which is a very the management upcoming 
theory and many researches are being done on this theory of system thinking. If you if you if A thinks that A is isolated, A is not isolated, A is actually related to B and when A and B they are related, they are related to C, D and E and F everyone. So in that this whole concept of and that's where I we come into that and that's where it is spirituality is not different, it, management is not different, science is not different. Einstein said that um, science without religion is lame and uh, religion without science is blind and that's where the idea is everything is one everything is united everything is one it's, we see that the aim of life is fraction to whole transformation and that's what it is they, we all see that we are fragmented we are in fraction but in reality we are not fragmented we are part of that bigger picture which is called a system thinking <sighs> is practicing pranayam alone is enough to reach Brahman state or human development or meditation is also required along with Pananyam. Please throw soul light on this Gaurav Nandi. Okay, Gaurav. Look, uh, Bhagavad Gita has got 18 chapters. First six chapters they talk about Karmi Yoga. Second, uh, second six chapters they talk about Bhakti Yoga and the last six chapters they talk about Gyan Yoga. Now, the, these three uh, divisions they actually take you to that path of Brahman because you haven't asked me God that's a good thing you, you're talking about Brahman Brahman is the supreme uh, consciousness the supreme Atma the supreme reality that's what Brahman is the supreme energy force that resides in the you, you, you in Brahman and this is from Brahma that this Brahmin word comes in the, from Brahm comes uh, Brahma and from Brahm comes Brahman and that's what it is. So Brahm is the su supreme reality, the absolute truth. So that's right. So if you can take any path, you can take Karma Yoga, you can take Bhakti Yoga, you can take Jnana Yoga and all this will reach that uh, ultimate reality. Chapter 2 verse 70 which says that you can, all the rivers they flow from all different directions but they come into the ocean. So they merge they, they into one place and that is the ocean. So you can take anything, whatever benefits you. Meditation is part of Dhyan Yoga which is part of uh, Bhakti Yoga. You're free to do it whatever is convenient for you but chapter 12 verse 12 says that you can go and read that chapter 12 verse 12 says that Arjuna says that look I'm confused I don't know sometimes you talk about Karma Yoga, sometimes you talk about Dhyan Yoga, sometimes you talk about Bhakti Yoga so what is the best method to attain that moksha ultimate liberation. So he says the best method is Karma Yoga. Okay, chapter 12 verse 12 it talks about the best way is karma yoga that you need to um, dwell into selfless action karma yoga you need to be like Mother Teresa in the service of humanity is service to God once you and Swami Vivekananda as well he said that Jeev is Shiv that's where it is so you can take anything whatever is benefit beneficial for you you can do it meditation is good meditation gives you raises your self awareness meditation raises your self management it makes you more aware of the society it makes you more aware of your own self so it gives you a silent moment to analyze your own self and that is good a person who is not able to understand his own self will not be able to understand anyone so being a leader it is a good a good thing being a manager it is good to understand yourself first and that's where it is for in emphasize in the last session that you need to manage yourself first manage me then you try to manage others now the um, next one perfect example of delusional okay um, are are not examples of common sense some commitment contradictory Arjun is asked to kill Karn by violating the rules of law and by following common sense whereas Bhishma not fighting against it and is considered as his commitment can't be considered Arjun's response to Krishna and Krishna in Kern's case as a commitment. Now that wasn't because he uh, that wasn't a commitment. Arjun was uh, wasn't committed to anything because if Arjun was committed to it, he would not have killed other people. He had actually on day 14 he had killed uh, Jaidra. He had killed Jaidra, the person who was responsible for organizing that chapter view on day 14 because on day 13 he took that oath that he will kill the person who was responsible for death of his son and it was Jadrat and he killed Jadrat on day 14. If he was so committed he should not have taken and he should not have violated the rules of uh, war and he should not have violated the rules of um, law and he should have stuck to his dharma but he didn't. He actually did kill Jadrat when Krishna had actually created a scenario of solar eclipse and that was a false scenario of creating a solar eclipse 
but that wasn't a solar eclipse so I, no arjuna never had a stand but the commitment only comes into play when you have a stand when you have a promise and no matter what you stick to that promise that i will fulfill it that's what commitment is today you say something tomorrow you don't say something so, so suppose if i make a commitment that i'll be vegetarian today and tomorrow i go out and i go to a party birthday party or a marriage party or reception i break my commitment and I, then i say that from next day i'll be a vegetarian that is not commitment Commitment is that you maintain that continuity. It is not occasional. The common sense could be occasional, but commitment is never occasional. Now, and we are exceeding time, so we'll take. There are so many questions. We'll take another. Okay, this. Okay, uh, sorry, I mixed it. That example, perfect example of delusional, is coming from God of Anand, which is again a, a delusion of uh, between confidence and competence, which Arjuna had perfect example. Now, this question, which I answered, was from Sivalia. So uh, that, that is how I've answered it. Next question, which is how does meditation help in knowing your own capabilities? And that's where it is kind of meditation. Meditation. Pankaj, this is coming from Pankaj. Pankaj, uh, meditation gives you silent moment to understand your own self because the world is so chaotic and we, in that uh, chaos we forget to analyze our own self, we forget to peep inside our own heart, we peep to understand our own self. Uh, chapter 6, uh, Sloka 20 itself, that in, the, in meditation, in the silence, the truth will reveal itself, the self will reveal itself, there is no other way. When your mind is silent, when your mind is concentrated, when your mind is focused, the self will reveal itself. And that is what how meditation helps you. Meditation will help you in understanding your strengths. Meditation will help you in understanding your weakness. Chapter 7 verse 21 says that, I, when I say that you can write it down, quote it and check it in the Bhagavad Gita. Chapter, uh, chapter 7 verse 21 it says that Krishna says that I will unify your faith in the object that you desire. So any object that you desire with all the faith and all the devotion and all the dedication I will in, uh, unify your faith in that and you will get the object that you desire. That's what it is whatever you desire, whatever you meditate on, whatever your capability is, whether you meditate on the apple and you think that it is gravity or whether you med meditate on something else or you meditate on your own capabilities you will get the answer so it's, it depends on what thing you want to meditate but definitely meditation helps in getting you that silence and in silence you're able to understand your own self now there's another question how is karma beneficial in recent corrupted age yes so corruption I understand what you mean by politics we don't we need to blame politicians for the corruption we are corrupt as well by not entering into politics and all good people preaching and putting the philosophies that politicians are corrupt but will, will not improve the corruption all those people those who have good vision all those people those who have good character they need to jump into politics to get rid of corruption because this is the theory of nature that if a bucket is already full with water you cannot fill that bucket with water of Ganges you have to get rid of that water to fill it with Ganges you have to overflow the water that is already filling that bucket with the pure uncontaminated water so all those people those who are outside preaching but not actually entering the arena of corruption and not willing to sacrifice anything won't actually help and get rid of corruption. Corruption is there. Corruption is one of the C's that is detrimental for the leadership. So that is a good thing that you, you raised the corruption. Corruption is detrimental to leadership. Those 10 C's are there, but the other three C's which are very detrimental to the uh, growth of leadership. So that's right. So corruption is there. You can't get rid of corruption. But now there was a, there's a quotation by Mahatma Gandhi, be the change that you want to see the change in the world. So be the change. We take the initiative just being sitting in the office and in your cubicle and thinking that everything is corrupt won't help you. Okay, Raju has already left and I have answered that. Okay. Now I'll take another five minutes and I'll try to answer as much as I can. Saurabh Chaudhary has got, if 
if we do not think about the result and only concentrate on doing of the task, then how will how will we improve our performance in case our ways are not enough for us to achieve the target? That's right. This is called as improving your performance. How do you improve your performance? Not actually dedicating your whole intention. What happens? See that. So psychologically, I'll take this. Don't take the psychologically. What the problem is that when mind can only focus at one thing at one point of time. If you if you devote your mind to one thing that I am working as well as trying to target the end result of it, you are not putting your 100 percent. You won't be able to excel in the action that you are trying to perform. You won't be able to put the, there won't be any competence in performance of action. Why? Because you have got a divided focus of energy. One energy is being concentrated on the work that you are doing. Another part of your brain is concentrated on the fruit that you will be getting. So how come you will be able to give you 100 percent? You won't be able to give you 100 percent. And that's the idea. In one point of time, you only focus at one thing. You just do your Duty. You just do it. If you're a software developer, keep doing it. Give your best to it. Give your best ability. Forget what you will, will get it. You just be in that frame, and you, you and you be in that mindset, and you work it out. Now, performance. Performance is not um, linked to your end result. It is not linked to your fruits. It is not linked to your paycheck. Paycheck. Performance is linked to your strength and weaknesses. You, you're trying to draw a constructive feedback that what I did wrong, what I did not do right, but, and you learn the lessons and you incorporate it for the future things. That is that is um, a wisdom. That's what it is. It is not that you don't have to. That, that, that's right. There is no conflict. Performance is different. Uh, concentrating solely on getting the um, um, results of your action is different because you will always have a divided um, you will always have a divided energy. And look, there is a saying that wherever your attention goes, the focus goes. So the moment your attention goes to the end product, your focus goes. You lose your attention. You lose your focus from the action that you are trying to perform. And this is what karm yoga is. Nishkam means selfless. Karm, karm yoga means action. You perform your action selfless without having any selfish motive. That's right, you get the paycheck, that is why. But you don't work just for the paycheck. You do what you like. At the same time, you like what you do. You understand what I mean? means you need to do it. You love, you love, you love the job that you do. At the same time, and I love the, I like the job that you do. means I, I like the job. But at the same time, you should be liking, I like what I do and do as I like. That, that is what I mean. Here then it is, hi Mr. Prakash, this is Samrat uh, Vishwas. Just wanted to know, uh, he's left, I won't answer that. So he's left, uh, then there is another one. Where from the initiative comes? Is it as a result of motivation or purely from within? It comes from motivation is occasional. It comes when you are demotivated. You motivate yourself by looking into, by reading or, get, or getting mentor or by reading leadership books or by reading spirituality or meditating. It is uh, motivational is occasional, but uh, the pure motivation, the pure drive comes from within. The pure drive comes from within, and, and that's where it is. So, Omkar, how to resolve the team conflicts? Uh, the best way, best way to resolve team conflict is communication. I believe communication, and no, I don't believe, I don't believe, so I just remember. Peter Drucker, he said that 60% of management problems, they are due to faulty communication. And that's where it is. That, that It comes from faulty communication. So if you, look, when we don't communicate, most of the problems, all the major problems, they come from communication. And all the major problems, they are resolved by communication. So that's how you communicate. You have to listen to your team members. It will resolve your conflict. Because everyone or someone might have some of the other grudges. Just listen. Don't arrive to any conclusion. Don't have your opinion. Don't form any judgment. Just listen. Just be present. Just acknowledge what the person is saying. And then be present and be active and do active listening. Don't arrive to any conclusion. And that, that's my experience. Seriously, that's my experience to resolve um, management conflicts, team conflicts. I have I had that experience a lot. So that's how I do it. Be patient, focus, concentrate, communicate, let other person release his frustration. Problem comes from when the, fr the frustration is not released. Once the frustration is released, the, problem, the person in the team who's trying to create problem will be at ease. Now, but, um, I'll, I'll take two more questions and then we'll conclude it. Now, this is coming from 
Deepak, Deepak Rathor, the work, the work I got is not of my own interest. How can I get rid of it? Deepak Rathor, then you need to find something that is interesting. Do what you like, like what you do. And if that is work is not interesting, then no point in doing that job. Get rid of your job, find something else. Hi, how to deal with this is Arindham Sa. How to deal with a person who thinks he knows everything? Mm. That is the sick mentality. Means that there are people in the world that they do think that uh, the knowledge actually starts from them, and all the knowledge of the world resides within them, and all the knowledge uh, finishes at their end. But uh, uh, I, I don't have an answer. How to deal with a person who thinks he knows everything? I don't know. Means uh, what can I see? It can, it's 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 uh, it's the situation that you are in. Try to think about the situation. But there's no. This, sorry, but I won't stretch on this because I don't have an answer because there is no clear-cut answer for this. People are there in the world that they have got a bad attitude, but uh, can't answer that. Again, uh, this is. Uh, Last question, is Krishna more like a coach and not a leader and is a coach and a leader different? No, no, no. And that's where it is. A coach, a coach is a attribute of a leader and then I, we have got the 10 and that's where my research is, that's where my understanding is, that's where I believe that those 10 C's, they are important and coach, coach is a word that has been referred by many leadership uh, speakers led by leadership gurus and in many management books, coach is there coach is existing and coach is different from being a leader. Leader is which is a bigger picture which is sitting at the higher level and coach is something which is sitting at the bottom. So coach and all those other skills they combine together and they make it a leader. So Krishna is a leader first and then and he is a leader because he has got those 10 leadership skills and coach being the last one is one of them. A leader is a good coach. And. Uh, Thank you all. Uh, there are so many questions. I won't be able to answer all that. So, and it's not good for others as well, at, uh, attendees attending it. So um, that will take uh, another half an hour or so. So sorry, I've not been able to answer all the questions. So, um, but uh, let's see. We'll uh, if you have some questions and which has not been answered in this one, we'll take it up in the next session, which is on 14th of June at uh, five o'clock. India time. Thank you all. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the insightful presentation, Surya. It was a great one. I'm sure our attendees loved it. We could see the interest from the lot of questions, number of questions that came up today. Yeah. Thank you, Mumi. I would also like to thank all our participants for the support in making this webinar a success. The recording of this session would be available on techgeek.com on this webinar page by today evening. Thank you all. Have a great day.